Imagine a D&D game with no rules, or worse yet, imagine a D&D game with rules, but where no one can seem to agree upon what they mean. Where each player uses the rules to their own best advantage without regard for the other player's interests, and where the game simply devolves into an arguing contest among players. Can you imagine spending four hours of your life at the gaming table where you're supposed to be having fun, but instead everyone is just arguing? And the sad part of this all is that I'm sure there are many of us here that have been in that exact same situation. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is not a happy time. People complain all the time about their gaming groups not sticking together and fizzling out. Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. If you ever have a gaming group that is pretty much just non-stop arguing, that group is gonna implode sooner rather than later. And this is one of the reasons that the Game Master's role as the Arbiter is so very critical. Hi, I'm Luke Hart, and on this channel, I share my nearly 30 years of Game Master experience so that you, so that you, <laughs> I'm so dumb, can run amazing games that your players will love. And today we're talking about the five crucial responsibilities of the Game Master in the role of the Arbiter. Now, a few weeks ago on the channel, we talked about the seven primary roles of a Game Master, and one of those roles is that of the Arbiter. So in this video, we are going to deep dive on the Arbiter role, because if you neglect your responsibilities as the Arbiter, your game will greatly suffer, and most likely so will you. You. What does it mean to be an Arbiter? The act of being the Arbiter in a tabletop role-playing game, such as Dungeons & Dragons, is sometimes referred to as judging or refereeing the game. Essentially, you are officiating the rules during play, and although players can help with this to a certain degree, it is the primary role of the Game Master to do this. And furthermore, even though players might help with looking up rules in the books, because Many of these games we play have tons of rules, don't they? It is always the Game Master's final decision on how a rule is enforced or interpreted for that matter. The essence of being an Arbiter is that when a player tells the Game Master what they want to do, the Game Master uses the rules and their own judgment to determine what happens. Many times this involves requesting the player to make a roll of the dice, and then based upon what the roll is, the Game Master determines what the results of the player character's actions are. So this is pretty basic, pretty simple stuff, right? However, in order to properly execute the role as an Arbiter, there are five crucial things that a Game Master must do. Before we jump in, I wanna let you know that we currently have a 25% off 4th of July sale over on the DM Layer store. So if you've been eyeing some of our 5th edition or Pathfinder 2 resources, now is the time to scoop them up. The sale ends this Friday. And if you're a new Game Master feeling perhaps a little overwhelmed and stressed out, this book right here can help alleviate some of that pressure you feel. In The Secret Art of Game Mastery, you'll find decades of experience from a team of veteran Game Masters at your fingertips. Unlike similar books which only focus on mechanics, The Secret Art of Game Mastery delves into topics such is dealing with problems, scheduling for success, organization, and improving as a game master. Of course, you'll also get our best advice on world building, creating adventures, and designing amazing encounters. And everything is system agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you're running D&D, Pathfinder, Shadow Dark, or something else. You can get The Secret Art of Game Mastery over on the DMR store. And if you grab the companion books, The Secret Art of Preparation and The Secret Art of Note-Taking, you'll be able to prepare for and track your ongoing campaign with ease. Number one, learn the rules. Look, I don't care how long you have been running a game system like D&D or Pathfinder, you're probably never going to learn all the rules and certainly not have them memorized. It is extremely rare for a GM to know every rule of the game every time. Even when we look at so-called rules light tabletop RPGs, they still tend to have lots of rules. Right here I have one of my current favorite lightweight tabletop RPGs, Shadow Dark. And this bad boy here still has over 300 pages. Now, yes, the core rules of how to run the game can probably be summed up in about 30 pages or so, and I think they are. But there are still lots of ancillary rules that are going to come up from time to time that you're just not gonna have memorized. So overall, my recommendation is that a game master learn the basic concepts of the rules rather than trying to focus on learning every single rule in the books. We are also gonna find in almost any game system is that 80% of the game is played with about 20% of the rules and the rest of the rules will come up sporadically during play. So what you wanna do is focus on learning that 20% that you're going to need on a continual 
and frequent basis. And then when the other 80% of the rules come up, you can either look them up quickly in the book or just make a house ruling to keep things moving along. But beyond just knowing the letter of the law, so to speak, it's important for the game master to understand the intent, the spirit of the rules. Many times when I'm running Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder 2, I'll come across rules that I'm pretty sure the game designers intended to mean one thing, even though the rules seem to indicate something else. And understanding that spirit and intent is important to being able to adjudicate and officiate. You see, this helps you a lot when settling an argument or a discussion with a player. And I will often use that line of defense as well. I will say that even though the rules seem to say X, that was not the spirit or intent of the rule, and therefore I'm going to rule Y. The bottom line is that you cannot be an arbiter if you don't have an understanding of the core rules and the underlying principle of the rules, unless you're not gonna use any rules at all, in which case I guess it's a free for all and you're not even using the game system. So let's just assume you are using the rules. And I guess technically you can be an arbiter even if you don't know the rules, but this would be akin to me as a soccer referee. My knowledge of soccer rules is very bad. I know that you have to kick the ball down the field and get it in the net. That's about it. If a player lowers their shoulder and knocks another over, I'm going to say that's okay because when I played football, I did it all the time. So yeah, sure, why not? That sounds fun. I, I don't think you can actually do that in soccer. I don't think you can knock people over and kick them and stuff. That's probably rugby, right? I don't know. Okay, so what is the best way to go about learning the rules? First, you should probably start with reading the rule books, right? That, that's always a good place to start. Although I'll wager a guess that some game masters don't do that. Probably should though. <laughs> Although, and of course, if they don't, their players are likely to notice. Just, I guess, don't be that game master unless you're like listening to the books on YouTube or something. I, I don't know. Now, some of these rule books are massive. So having an idea of what the most important rules are will help guide your learning. Generally speaking, the rules about combat and skill usage are the ones that are gonna come up the most during game. For instance, if you look at your average D&D game or your Pathfinder 2 game, 50% or more of your game time is probably gonna be spent in combat. So you should probably know those rules. And then the other 40% of the game time is gonna be spent in social interactions and exploration scenes. And during those moments, the players are most likely going to be using skills such as investigation or perception or diplomacy or intimidation. So if you want to shortcut things a little bit, if you focus on the combat rules and the skill rules, you're gonna be learning the majority of the rules that get used in the game, at least from the game master's point of view. Now, of course, there are a whole bunch of character creation rules and feats and things like that that apply to characters. Ultimately, your players should, should really know how those rules work themselves because they pertain to their own characters. But it definitely behooves the game master to know that stuff as well. I'm a player in a Pathfinder 2 game right now, and one of the main reasons I joined that game as a player is so that I could learn the character and player side of the rules. Because there's no better way to learn something than by doing it, in my opinion. Now, while you're learning the rules, look for commonalities. For instance, in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, the most prominent rule is the advantage and disadvantage mechanic. Most of the game is built around that mechanic. So the GM should remember that and file it in the back of their brain with the expectation that most of the time, the answer to any sort of modifier question will be advantage or disadvantage. Pathfinder 2nd Edition, however, focuses on smaller plus one or plus two static bonuses with limitations on how bonuses can stack. This is an example of how understanding the underlying mechanics of the game helps the game master make better decisions when the rules aren't known or clearly defined. Now, part of learning the rules is striving to know them better and better as time goes on. I also suggest reviewing the rules you use often and explore the less commonly used rules as well, especially before a game session. For instance, in my Pathfinder 2 game, the rules around perception are something that I'm still struggling to understand because they're fairly complex. So before a game, I often turn to the rule section on perception, obscurement, and detecting characters to brush up on them. And I literally have that section in the book bookmarked so that I can easily find it. The other thing that I do is that when I'm going to have a game session where less commonly used rules are featured, I brush up on those rules. For instance, the rules on swimming or drowning don't come up a whole lot 
lot. But if I know that my next game session is going to involve underwater exploration, I might want to take a peek at those rules, right? Number two, adjudicating rules. Once the GM knows the rules, or at least understands the core mechanics, adjudication just comes down to ensuring that the rules are followed and that they are the same for everyone. Now, my suggestion is that the central mechanics of the game should rarely be ignored. In other words, you should follow them almost all the time. This ensures that the game remains properly balanced and makes sense. However, rules can be ignored in exchange for fun, of course. This is often known as the rule of cool. But those exceptions to the rules should be made knowingly and intentionally and still hold to the intent or spirit of the rules, even when they're not adhering to the rules as written. For example, in D&D, you may choose to give someone an advantage to support a cool moment, even if that advantage would normally be canceled by disadvantage that they're currently experiencing. Or you might allow a player to make a roll to jump farther than the rules would normally allow them if they come up with a good reason for it. However, the distance that they are able to jump should not be so far outside the realm of reason. For instance, if you're a cleric with no athletic ability whatsoever, who wears a full plate armor and you want to make a 25 foot jump, well that's just not gonna be possible. Unless, of course, they're propelled forward by the breath of a red dragon breathing on their bum. Then, possibly, I could see that happening, although they're also likely to take 12d6 fire damage as well. The Game Master should not make exceptions for some players, but not make exceptions for other players, especially when considering the same rules. If you always give Sally advantage when she shouldn't have it, but Timmy never gets the same treatment, well, that's favoritism. And things like that are the sort of behavior that causes bitterness, infighting, and games falling apart. Making rulings. The Game Master is called upon to make rulings on a variety of situations, either because the rule doesn't exist or because the group doesn't know the rule offhand and pausing the game to look it up would break the momentum momentum of a dramatic moment or negatively impact pacing. And here are my suggestions for moments when the Game Master has to make a ruling. First, it cannot be understated that sometimes you just need to do your best and make a quick ruling rather than spending 20 minutes pouring through the books during a game session or looking up discussions on Reddit because a rule has a great deal of gray matter to it gray matter, gray, gray area to it. Rules don't have gray matter, but I hope we do. I don't know, maybe they took it out. Who knows, or you didn't have it when you were born, or just, we should just move on with this. And when you're making these quick rulings, understanding the underlying principles and mechanics of the game you're playing makes it far easier to make good rulings and good judgment calls. If you never bothered to learn the core game mechanics of your game system, then the chances of you making a good ruling in the moment are very bad. When you're making an off-the-cuff Game Master ruling, you should do your best to adhere to the basic concepts of the rules as much as possible. For instance, if you're playing Dungeons & Dragons as the Game Master, you're probably going to award either advantage or disadvantage in your game when a gray area comes up. But if you're playing Pathfinder 2, you're gonna wanna give a plus one circumstance bonus or a negative one circumstance circumstance penalty. Finally, if you don't know a rule and you do end up making a call during a game session, you should look the rule up after the game session to learn how it is intended to be run. Many times what I'll do is that during a game session, I will tell my players that I'm going to make a quick ruling so that we can just keep on moving and keep on playing the game. But then I will look into it after the game is over and get back to them probably through email. Or another thing that we often do is that I will make a quick ruling and then we keep on playing the game. But while we're doing that, another player who isn't actively doing something will look up the rule online or in the books. And then say 10 minutes later, we'll come back to that player and find out what they discovered. This probably won't impact the ruling that we already made, but it will help inform us in the future. By the way, if you're finding this information useful, please give me a thumbs up and share this video with a fellow game master. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, why not subscribe while you're at it? And if you have a reason why you don't want to subscribe, you know, you can yell it, tell me, tell me down below. Don't yell at me. I have a very fragile, very fragile person here. I get yelled at in the comments and I go cry in a corner. It's this horrible thing. So be, just be gentle. You can't take being yelled at. You should be making YouTube videos. <laughs> it's the wrong venue, baby. It's the wrong venue if you can't take a little bit of criticism. But I just want to create. I just want to create. Well, you can create. Just don't put it out in front of the entire world to see.
and then you won't have people criticizing you. It's pretty simple. Number three, determine limitations. As the arbiter, one of the things that you're going to have to do as well is determine limitations. Now, there are two basic categories for determining limitations. The first is the limitation of the rule's intent. And the second is the limitation of rules options. When we talk about the limitation of the rules intent, what we mean is understanding why the rules were written the way they were. That is understanding why the rules exist, but what the limits to those rules are. It probably sounds really confusing to you because it sounds confusing to me. So let's give you an example. <laughs> so, in a game system where a natural 20 always succeeds, the basic law of physics in the game world should still apply. Someone may be able to jump a 25 foot chasm on a natural 20, but they're not going to be able to jump to the moon or even across a 50 foot ravine. If you want to run an easier or harder game, understanding the way the rules work and adjusting them appropriately is essential. For example, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, a hero point can stop a character from dying and the characters get a free hero point every game session. If you want to make the game deadlier, eliminating the free hero point every session would do that. However, the game master should then make an effort to award hero points so that the core mechanic still has value. Pathfinder 2 is a deadly game as it is, and hero points exist in the game for a reason. Eliminating them entirely is something the game master should discuss with the players before making such a huge change. The second type of limitation, that of limiting rules options, applies when customizing a campaign or adventure along a specific theme. For instance, I'm currently running a Escape from the Fae for my Ancient Dragon Patrons, which is a continuation of my Into the Fae adventure module. And for Escape from the Fae, I told my players that none of their characters are allowed to be from the Fae plane. This is because the theme of the entire campaign revolves around the idea that the characters are trapped on the Fae plane and that they're trying to find their way home. So if they're from the Fae plane, the entire campaign premise pretty much falls apart. However, it is important to note that these limitations should never be arbitrary. Whenever you impose a limitation on your characters or gameplay, there should be a very specific purpose for it. For example, let us suppose you hate animal races because you think they break the seriousness of the game. Should you then ban races like tabaxi or cat folk? Now it's not completely arbitrary per se, but it's not the best of reasons either, in my opinion. So I think that it would be far better to simply explain to your players the tone you're trying to achieve and then ask the players if they'd not mind introducing those sorts of characters. This is a far better solution than just saying no. However, that said, there are times when no is the answer. For example, there are several races in D&D 5th edition that can fly at first level. However, the last time I knew D&D's own Adventurers League banned those races explicitly because they can fly. You see, they understand that flying at first level is a major game-breaking ability in many circumstances. And yet, in most situations, the no should come with a but. For example, if a player declares they wish to convince the king to make them a noble in charge of their entire household, the game master may decide that that isn't even possible. It is simply outside the scope of what a character is able to do with their diplomacy skills. However, the game master might respond that if the characters were to go on a certain mission that would be of great value to the king, that a minor noble title might be on the table. If they return successful, of course. If they fail, they should probably never show their faces around there again. You see, this results in the game master setting limitations, but also giving the players a mechanism for achieving some of what they were looking to get in the game. And you're doing it through a reasonable means that makes for a new adventure hook that furthers game Play. Number four, teaching the rules. Ah yes, you thought it was bad enough that you had to learn all the rules. <laughs> Well, guess what? You get to teach the rules as well. Now, there are a lot of reasons that a game master may need to become a teacher of the rules. You have new players. You're generating new characters, which can be complex in many systems. You're introducing new rules to an established system. You're changing to a new edition, or you have players that are used to playing under another game master who had established different house rules. I was a teacher for four years of my life, and I can tell you that teaching is an art. And the core to the art of teaching rules is knowing what the rules are, recognizing where those rules are confusing or contradictory, and understanding how each player learns. For some players, a verbal explanation may be enough. 
Others do better with a practical demonstration, like a sample combat. And yet others learn better through the written word, such as showing them the rule in the book and then walking them through the text. Now, not everyone is a teacher. And by the way, did you know that about 44% of teachers quit within the first five years? Even those of us who do choose that profession and gain the necessary education to do so still give up at an alarming rate. Of course, as a former teacher and someone who's also done a lot of volunteering in a variety of schools, I can tell you that there are probably two main reasons most tweachers, most tweachers, most teachers quit. However, we're not gonna talk about that today because folks might get upset spaghetti over that topic and it has nothing to do with D&D anyway, does it? So I have no idea why I even brought it up. Anyway, as I was, <laughs> as I was saying, not everyone is a teacher. And if you think this is a weakness of yours, there are tons of good resources online and many great YouTube channels that specifically teach the rules of the game. For instance, if you're playing Pathfinder or D&D, there's a YouTube channel called How It's Played that has tons of videos that are kind of like a wiki how for specific rule sets within the games. For Traveler and Call of Cthulhu, Seth Skarkowski has an entire video series about the rules, their intent, and how to play them. Most of the major gaming companies probably have their own YouTube channels with videos that walk through how to get started and the rules in general as well. Number five, drawing a hard line. The final thing to remember is this. At the end of the day, the game master is the arbiter. What the game master says goes. Now I firmly believe that players should be allowed to make their case by citing rules within the intent and the spirit of the game to help support those cases, of course. The word of the game master at the end of the day is law. I always let my players state their side before I make my final decision. However, that final decision is mine. The bottom line is that the game master should not allow the game to grind to a halt because a player wants to argue about a rule. The GM needs to make a call and the game needs to move on. And quite frankly, if you find yourself with a player who always wants to argue about the rules and this is causing your entire game to grind to a halt time and time again, ruining the game atmosphere at the game table, well, this is one of the problem types of players that needs to be dealt with. And sometimes if they're not willing to let things go and let you fulfill your role as the arbiter, the best thing might be to remove them from the game. Look, no one wants to spend three hours out of four arguing about the rules. That is never fun, except for maybe the person who insists on doing it. Maybe, maybe it's fun for them. The time for those sorts of discussions is after the game session or between game sessions, not during. But that's just what I think. What advice do you have for game masters in the Arbiter role? And don't forget to take advantage of our 25% off 4th of July sale on the DM Layer store. And check out the Secret Art of Game Mastery at the link below to get decades of compiled game master experience at your fingertips. Now, if you missed my first video on game master roles and would like to learn about all seven, click right here to watch it. And until next time, happy game mastering.